This is a German street theatre audio introduction for Laughing Boy by Stephen Unwin after Justice for Laughing Boy by Sarah Ryan, directed by Stephen Unwin. Laughing Boy runs from the 25th of April to the 31st of May 2024 at German Street Theatre, located at 16B German Street, London, SW1Y 6ST, an intimate basement theatre of 70 seats. This introduction is intended to give visually impaired theatre-goers an advanced description of the set, the characters, their costumes and other visual elements before coming to see the play. In an effort to describe the play's evolving visuals, it will contain some minor spoilers. Information on accessibility will be given at the end. The play lasts approximately 100 minutes. There is no interval and please note that toilets are not accessible during the performance. There is some use of bright lighting during the performance. The overview on the German Street website begins with a quote. So much magic. So much love. So much laughter. So much work. So much rage. And so many tears. The synopsis. Connor is, well, Connor. He loves buses, Eddie Stobart and Lego. He also has learning disabilities. When he dies an entirely preventable death in NHS care, his mum, Sarah, can't get a straight answer as to how it happened. But Sarah and her family won't stop asking questions, and soon an extraordinary campaign emerges. Demanding the truth, it uncovers a scandal of neglect and indifference that goes beyond Connor's death to thousands of others. Both personal and political, Sarah Ryan's impassioned, frank and surprisingly funny story bursts onto the stage for the first time. Writer and director Stephen Unwin returns to German Street Theatre following his first play, All Our Children, and directing the sold-out hit, Farm Hall. The set, space and visual elements. Upon entering the theatre space and taking your seat, you will be greeted by a small wood floor stage at floor level and a white painted wall that curves all the way across the back of the stage. On the left side, there is a doorway that leads to the toilets, which is not used until the very end of the performance. Spaced evenly across this white wall are four plain modern dining chairs. The seven actors will then enter via the doorway and will either sit on these chairs, sit on the floor in the case of Connor, or stand. They will come to the front of the stage when active in a scene and drift to the back again when not, but will always remain present and often engaged in the action through facial expression. Again, especially in the case of Connor himself, who often engrosses himself in play with a large toy double-decker bus. The chairs will also be brought forward to serve a variety of functions, for example, grouped together to represent the seating of a vehicle. At the start of the play, the stage is lit in normal, warm brightness. The purpose of the white wall becomes clear when the title of the first part, Before, is projected onto it in large, clear, bold white text. Soon, an actor utilises a mobile phone in a text message conversation and the text messages themselves are projected onto the wall. When the characters travel in a vehicle, the passing cityscape is projected, with the details blurred out. Arriving at another location will trigger more blurred projections of surroundings, for example, a hospital, a paediatrician's office or a Burger King. Later, a shop window full of clear model vehicles appears and the colourful arch of Chinatown. After just a few minutes, when the Louis Armstrong song What a Wonderful World is heard, the projection wall will come alive with archive footage, clear and bright, not blurred, of a choir of schoolchildren. There is also archive footage of the real family, including, for example, the real Connor's birthday party with a racing car cake, or towards the play's end, footage from Connor's funeral, with family and friends carrying his coffin. The real Connor periodically appears projected as a late teen, as he does in the promotional poster for the show. In this image, he is a white boy of slim build and medium-length fringed brown hair with sideburns in a sort of Britpop style. He is wearing a blue denim shirt and crouching with his arms crossed over his knees. He wears a half smile and is surrounded by a collage of bus, sun and sparrow. Five minutes into the play, some of Connor's favourite YouTube videos are projected, the Lego Batman film and footage of lorries. One actor will interact with them, hitting play on the large projected player to start the video. 
Then some collages of buses appear. A vivid and dynamic animation of Connor Town is shown. Ten minutes in, where a bright kids' storybook-style map of a town appears, covering the entire wall, the animation following a double-decker red bus as it drives around the town. When we hear a thud sound, doom, this indicates that a quote, usually from a doctor or other official, or from a report, has been projected in huge, bold captions. These begin with words used to describe Connor at 17 minutes, like special. At approximately 28 minutes, on the line into the dark, there is a notable shift. The lights dim, and the location title NHS Slade House is projected over mottled walls. Later, the minutes of meetings are projected. This happens several times, with various board meetings and inquest reports. The text sometimes appears one paragraph at a time, at reading speed, or sometimes fills the entire wall with blocks of text, an overload of information too much to be read. When music is heard, this often indicates a transition to another part, including a brief dimming of lights and the projection of another part's heading, for example, after at 38 minutes, or justice at one hour, or crime and punishment at 1 hour 35. During the after section at 53 minutes, a colourful, vibrant collage of pictures and photos of Connor, buses and lorries, tweets people have written, cartoons and all sorts of creative work appear. All as days count off in the top corner for hashtag 107 days of action that Connor was in Slade House. The multitude of images soon appear in a breathtaking grid covering the back wall. A few minutes later, the wall is similarly covered by a patchwork quilt, again featuring slogans, cartoons and, of course, an abundance of bright red double-decker buses. The section titled Justice, beginning at one hour, is predominantly characterised by the location title Coroner's Court, with official coat of arms over black and white projection of rows of wooden pew-like seats. The coroner's desk is represented by two chairs and other characters stand behind a chair when speaking from the dock. The family stand outside the coroner's court in a family unit tableau, taking a selfie, which is then projected onto the wall. They are interviewed by the media, represented by one cast member lit and speaking to them from the audience. Approaching approximately 90 minutes, a BBC breakfast show is projected, real footage of the actual interview that took place. Soon after, the names and portraits of other people who have died in care appear, framed in black grid. A cut to black then heralds the start of a monologue, signifying a recorded telephone message, the audio waveform of which is projected onto the wall. At 90-odd minutes, there is another transition into the crime and punishment section, where the shield of the Thames Valley Police appears. Other companies and departments, for example the Department of Health and Social, have their logos appear, including the satirical NHS Sloven. Before the funeral, Connor exits through the door into the light. Tears streak the actor's cheeks. The play closes with footage of the laughing, infant, real Connor. Sarah Ryan is played by Janie D. My name is Janie D. I'm going to be 62 in June. My pronouns are she, her. I am white, British, English person with a bit of Scots and Irish in me and probably a bit of Spanish as well somewhere. My eyes are blue and yellow and my height is five foot seven and I would say I'm slender at the moment. So I play Sarah Ryan, who wrote the book and who is the mother in the play, but in real life as well. It's really very nice to have a real person to base your character on. So all my costumes come from a shop called Toast, which is actually where Sarah Ryan buys her clothes from. I wear a pair of very dark navy, quite baggy trousers with a very thin yellow check, which you can hardly see. Um, very, very fine print. I wear a an orange deep burnt orange t-shirt with yellow stripes and I wear a deep orange cardi done up at the waist only. I leave the rest of the buttons open. I have a 
red and orange necktie. Um, it's a bit like a cowboy, but when I put it on, it doesn't look so like that. I, when I first saw it, I was a bit worried, but it's all right. It goes. And on my feet, I'm wearing some multicolored socks uh, that go right up to my knees so you don't see any flesh. And I am wearing a pair of pale green plimsolls. I have my hair tied back in a ponytail and a pair of deep red framed spectacles. I actually don't have the glass in because it reflects the light of the, of the theatre and so you can't see my eyes. So we've punched out the lenses um, and it still looks like I'm wearing glasses, I think. So that's clever theatrical effect. Probably the only prop any of us has, but certainly I have in the show, is a mobile phone which I take out of my pocket at certain times to answer the phone or to make a phone call, usually to a doctor. The phone calls are usually meant to be between the home, which is outside Oxford, and a hospital inside Oxford. So to create that sort of sense of completely different spaces, we turn away from each other sometimes, or it doesn't have to be like that, but it helps to create the sense of distance. When I met Sarah Ryan, I noticed that she doesn't speak in a very theatrical way. She's a bit like on London, a bit sort of off, and she speaks very quietly and she laughs a lot like that. Um, and um, it's very quiet, her voice. So to mimic her isn't exactly what I do, but I'm trying to catch the essence of her, which isn't quite me. It's a little bit more London, so a bit like that you know, not, not punching out the consonants, but leaving them like that. That's how she speaks, and she laughs a lot. But in this play, Sarah Ryan has to go through the most terrible worries about her son, who has different episodes, as you'll hear, happen to him. And during those scary moments for her, uh, she paces, or I pace, up and down, quite a lot. Sometimes uh, I evidently wring my hands and uh, probably frown quite a lot. I live this part. I, d I don't honestly feel like I'm acting it, to be honest with you. It's difficult to pretend it. It just feels so real, like it's really happening. The actor who's playing my son, Connor Sparrowhawk, who we hear right at the top of the play, basically has died, is nevertheless with me almost throughout the entire play, and we touch and hold each other quite a lot. It's something that just developed in the rehearsals, and it seemed absolutely right that he should be present, even though the play is about his death, but that he is present and he has things to say about his life and he has things to say about his dreams for the future. Um, it Actually, I think it makes it more poignant, mm -hmm. possibly, that we do have contact with him as if he's still there, I like it because, for me, it's resonant of when you do lose somebody that they still carry on in your mind and in your life, almost as if they're still present sometimes. Connor Sparrowhawk is played by Alfie Friedman. Hey there, my name's Alfie Friedman. I'm 21 years old. I'm white and 5 foot 7 inches tall, have green eyes, go by he, him, and have long, fluffy brown hair. In the show, I play Connor Sparrowhawk, or Laughing Boy, as he's called by his friends and family. Throughout the performance, I wear a dark blue linen shirt, light blue denim jeans, and plain white trainers whilst playing him. As we get to learn about Connor in the past, he also gets to observe the story that all the other characters go through in the future as a spectator. So because of this, you may hear me performing unexpectedly closer to or further away from the audience. But don't be alarmed, this is just to capture the past, present, and future. As Connor, I get to use my body to react very viscerally to all of the stories that my friends and family are telling about me, alongside having a bus which I get to roll around the stage, especially when people are talking about just how much I loved all of the Root Masters in London. When hearing about all of the rights and wrongs in the story, my eyebrows tend to go right up to the top of my head because of just how expressive Connor Sparrowhawk was. His reactions stem from incredibly excited to downright irritated out of injustice, and this is all abundantly clear through how he vocalises himself. His reactions to characters in the show, especially when people are horrid to his mum, is incredibly snappy, and incredibly visceral, and incredibly 
full of justice. Rich is played by Forbes Masson. Hi, I'm Forbes Masson. I'm uh, 60 years old. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm five foot five and a half. I've got ginger hair. I've got sort of ginger beardy, sort of trimmed beard, blue eyes, got a bit of a podgy belly. Uh, I play uh, Sarah's partner, Rich, who's also Connor's stepdad. And uh, what I wear for that character is a blue jacket, a stripy blue shirt, Levi jeans, dark blue Levi jeans, and lovely brown sort of suede boots. Rich is quite, uh, he's sort of, I would say he's a sort of the, the rock in the piece. He's quite solid. He's quite a solid man. Oh, I wear glasses. I wear these uh, sort of heavy, dark framed glasses. Rich is, is, is there when he needs, when Sarah needs support. He's a man of few words. So he's sometimes in uh, the front of the action and sometimes he's sort of in the background just waiting there when Sarah needs him. I also play another character very briefly. I play the uh, chairman of Southern Health Board. I just slightly changed my accent for that. He's uh, not particularly sinister. He's, he's meant to be sort of a, a neutral character, but he verges on the, on the sinister. Owen and other characters are played by Lee Braithwaite. Hello, my name is Lee, um, Lee Braithwaite. I am 22 years old. My pronouns are he, they. I am mixed race, white Irish and black Caribbean. Um, I've got short brown curly hair, uh, brown eyes and tan skin. Um, I'm about 5'7", uh, sort of athletic, slender build. I play the reporter, the consultant, uh, a GP, a social worker, a receptionist, Cheryl, funeral director, a pathologist, Southern Health Trust, Southern Health lawyer, John Lish, Paul Bowen, Kieran, lead juror, a voicemail message, and Becca. It's a lot of characters. <laughs> I am wearing a um, sort of light blue baggy Carhartt shirt, um, green khaki baggy trousers, and black converses with white shoelaces. So I am Owen on top of all those other characters. So I don't know if I am Owen playing those characters or if I'm me playing those characters, and I'm also Owen. When I am playing other characters who aren't Owen, um, I do lots of different voices, I do lots of different accents, um, I change my physicality, so some of my characters have uh, very clear physical mannerisms. Um, Paul Bowen, for example, is a lawyer and he does a thing where he puts his hands together and he points his two index fingers at um, whoever he is asking questions to. Rosie and other characters are played by Molly Osborne. Hello, my name is Molly. I am five foot three. I have long brown hair. And my pronouns are she, her. I am white. I have sort of quite olivey, olivey white skin. I'm 26 years old. My eyes are green, sort of fairly slim, slimish stature. And I play, mostly I play Rosie, one of the family members. She's one of the oldest. And I also play a number of different characters. The first one being Dr. Jayawant. She's sort of quite skittish and quite nervous. I play a Slade House staff member. I play uh, the elusive Dr. Murphy, who uh, she has, she looks like she's sort of bitten a sour lemon. I play Keelan Gallagher. Um, she's Irish and I sort of do a, an attempt at doing an Irish accent like that. Um, I also play Mary Ann Bruce. Um, she is quite a still and um, kind of direct character. I also play Katrina Percy, who is a big CEO. I do her with a very satirical fake smile and a swinging, swinging sort of stature. Um, she's a very satirical kind of character. Another key one is the Oxfordshire Commissioner, who is quite posh and she sort of is quite upright and, and quite proper. And the rest of them, I sort of do various parts, like um, a Jura voice, a voice from the CQC, um, and a couple of different lawyers where I sort of stand up, say the line, 
um, as directly as possible and then sit back down again. The costume is the same throughout. I'm wearing um, black leggings and a black roll neck. My hair is sort of pushed back with a black headband. So my hair is sort of down my back. And on top of that, I have a navy blue dress on that kind of goes in at my waist and then has these little, little spaghetti straps that are tied in a bow over each of my shoulders. And I have my Doc Martin shoes on, which are very clumpy. They have a sort of buckle on them and a silver kind of triangle over the toes. And they're very thick and they're quite sort of gothic and cool. Gives, gives her a little bit of an edge. Will and others are played by Charlie Ives. Hi, I'm Charlie Ives. I'm 31 years old. She, her, um, white British woman. I have long, brown, wavy hair, which I usually wear loose or uh, loosely in a bun. I've got brown eyes. I'm five foot four and average build. And I've got a very mild West Midlands twang to my voice. My main character is Will, who is Connor's older brother, the oldest of the of the kids. He's basically got my voice, but I take out some of the West Midlands twang just to differentiate uh, him from me and to make him sound like a member of the family. Will quite often has his arms folded or in his pockets, and I try wherever possible to give him a kind of masculine stance and energy to differentiate from the plethora of other characters that I play. There are 23 characters that I play in the piece. Lots of them come and go briefly. There's a, a headmistress who's very, she's quite patronising. She's very well intentioned, but she pops up briefly and disappears again. We've got a, a 70 year old cave guide who takes them through the cave. He's got a slightly stooped uh, shoulders um, and he pops away again. We briefly see a Big Sue, a social worker, is a little bit rural, but she she's referenced more than we see her. Fran, who is uh, Sarah's best friend, is quite RP. She's Oxford. Um, she pops up a couple of times and she plays with her earrings um, and she's quite often on the phone. Then we see Slade Health staff member number two, who uh, gestures all up sort of around her shoulders and her chest, and she's very sort of blasé. Charlotte is Sarah Ryan's lawyer. She's very direct. She makes quite meticulous, specific gestures to get her point across. George Julian has her hand in her pocket. She holds uh, her phone in the other hand. She's from Devon, and I try to uh, get her voice as spot on as possible. Janet Reed, who made the Justice Quilt, is from the West Midlands, so I've given her a, a, a brummy accent, and she's got big gestures when she's talking about the Justice Quilt. She's smiley, she's bubbly. Uh, that smile quite often turns into tearfulness if she gets emotional. We have various support workers during the inquest um, who have different, different gestures. And then we get to Alan Jenkins, the lawyer, who's Murphy's barrister, who has a wide stance, big theatrical choreographed gestures to get his point across we meet various incidental characters and then in the board meeting we meet sarah sarah snow who reads her uh, speech from her phone uh, she's fiddling with her her collar with her neck she's very very nervous um, and all of these characters have the same costume as will they're all slightly different and they come and go and some are more important than others but they're all there so will wears a blue t-shirt blue jeans white converse trainers um and i tie my long hair back i plait it back off my face and put it in a bun to look a little bit more androgynous for all the different genders of my characters tom and other characters are played by daniel rainford Hello, I'm Dan. I'm a 27-year-old uh, man. I go by he, him. I'm white with a clean-shaven face, uh, occasionally with a little bit of a five o'clock shadow. I've got short, light brown hair with a fringe. I've got green eyes and I'm six foot tall with a slim build. And I also wear glasses with, a, with clear frames. I play Tom. Um, who is around about 24 years old, 
and the play goes back in time. So I will introduce myself as being either 13 years old, 14 years old or 16 years old at different points in the play. And I wear cream coloured cargo pants, a brown overshirt on top of a khaki green oversized t-shirt. And I also still wear my glasses as well. Other characters, I play a mixture of lawyers, coroners, MPs, and their voice and accent is a lot posher than my own. And with that becomes, a, I take on a more formal, upright posture, um, usually with closed hands, generally more grounded. There's a lot more stillness to these older characters, whereas when I play Tom, He's a lot more slouched, a little bit more relaxed. I'll sit on the ground with my legs crossed, arms folded, hands in pockets, a more sort of chilled out, casual posture. I also play a dog who is very fun to play. I run around on all fours um, with my knees off the floor, so on both hands, I'm running on my hands and my toes, and then I'll stop at one point and while Alfie is talking, I crouch almost in like a crawl position and I start sniffing his face and licking my lips and shaking, shaking my, uh, my hips a little bit in a dog-like manner. We're very like, we'll put our hands on each other's shoulders. If there's something sad that happens or we hear or feel something sad in the space or something that makes us angry, we'll occasionally put hands on each other's shoulders or we'll we'll hug we'll hug a lot yeah there's a very like warm um tactile approach to how the family interacts particularly the four young children content warnings our current production of laughing boy contains occasional loud noises continued discussion of death and medical neglect as well as depictions of grief there is frequent strong language infrequent use of ableist language infrequent acts of violence and one scene that depicts a short moment of self-harm. Directions to the theatre. 16B German Street London SW1Y6ST can be reached via a two-minute walk from Piccadilly Circus Station on the Piccadilly and Bakerloo lines. Simply exit the station via exit 3, head momentarily south down Regent Street St James's and take the first right onto German Street. The theatre entrance is 140 feet away next door to Papal's restaurant and opposite Tesco and Rowley's restaurant. From Green Park Station, it's a nine-minute walk. Turn right out of the Piccadilly Southside exit, walk down Piccadilly, past the Ritz Hotel, take the second right onto St. James's Street and the first left onto German Street. The theatre is a third of a mile away at the other end of the road. Accessibility at the German Street Theatre. There is, regrettably, no wheelchair access. German Street Theatre is down a steep flight of stairs in an old building, and despite best efforts, it has not proved possible to provide a lift or stairlift. Patrons with fold-up wheelchairs are often able to attend. The stairs descend straight from the entrance. After descending the first flight of steps, you enter a tiny corridor. The 70-seat theatre is to the right, down another short flight of steps. The box office and bar are located here to the left. If you're bringing your guide or assistance dog with you when you come, or require any other access assistance, please let the box office team help you. Call them on 0207 287 2875 and ask to speak to Penny Horner. During the performance, it is not possible to access the toilets. Before and after the performance, the toilets can be accessed by the doorway on the left of the stage, furthest from the stairs. Turn immediately right into a corridor and the male, then gender-neutral easy access, then female toilets are located within. Laughing Boy runs from the 25th of April to the 31st of May 2024, with showings at Monday to Saturday, 7.30pm, and Tuesdays and Saturdays at 3pm. Tickets are £35, £31 concession, available to over 65s, theatre unions, students, anyone with access needs or in receipt of universal credit. There are relaxed performances each week open to everyone. Relaxed performances are an opportunity for audiences to enjoy a show when the theatre and auditorium rules are eased, making it a more inviting environment for all. There is a JST pre-show debate on Wednesday the 8th of May at 5.45pm at German Street Theatre. 
Entry is free and you can reserve your seat by emailing boxoffice at germanstreettheatre.co.uk. For any other information, please call 0207 287 2875 or visit the website at germanstreettheatre.co.uk. We look forward to seeing you at the performance. A Bad Princess Productions audio introduction.